Welcome everybody to the 2021 Humanist UK Convention. Even 125 years ago in the 1890s, we were a forward thinking movement at the vanguard of social change. Your ongoing support makes that as true now as it has ever been. So once again, before the convention proper begins, I want to thank you for your ongoing commitment and support. And I hope you enjoy the talks ahead of you today. So with that said, I'll now hand over to our great friend Samira Ahmed, who will chair the first session of today's event, on which note the hashtag for the whole of today is Humanists, with an S, U 2021, that's Humanists 2021. If you've been attending our events, as so many of you have, you'll know Samira, so I'll keep my introduction extremely brief. She's a marvel, she's a wonder, she's a great chair of our events, a very popular broadcaster. Um, in my view, the best ever uh, BBC presenter to have hosted any of their religion ethics output, as well as her great news contributions, audio broadcaster of the year, um, BBC Radio Four Star, all round good egg and exceptional human, Samira Ahmed. Oh, thank you so much, Andrew. I'm overflowing with love for you today. Overly Samira. generous. Thank you. <laughs> Always a delight to do stuff for Humanist UK. Um, I'm really thrilled that you put me together with uh, Satnam Sangera, whose new book, Empire Land, How Imperialism Has Shaped Modern Britain, is a really, one, it's just a delightful read, and two, it's timely, and three, it's so thoughtful. Um, Satnam is well known as a, as a journalist. He's also written a, a memoir. He's also written a novel. Um, and I like what Jonathan Coe said about you, Satnam. Welcome to you. Um, Satnam is busy carving out his own literary niche in the multicultural British Midlands, which he explores with incredible grace, generosity, and humor. I know you're from the, the Midlands, the kind of probably London based now. Um, but I think that combination of grace, generosity, and humor is really what comes across in your writing. Um, so I'm gonna hold it up because I think the cover is so interestingly thought through, the, the image of the bulldog on a pillar. And of course, we're talking against the backdrop of rows over statues, over um, history not being disturbed, and yet we, we know that there's all kinds of really interesting history writing and interrogation going on, particularly connected to issues like Black, um, issues like Black Lives Matter. So I'm going to start by asking you, Satnam, because you would have begun this, what, maybe two or three years ago. What inspired or prompted you to write the book Empire Land? Um, thank you, Samira, for gen generous introduction. Um, I... I made a documentary for Channel 4 on Jalian Wallabar, a famous massacre that happened almost, I think, exactly 101 years ago. And I went to Amritsar to see where it happened. I mean, it was where about 900 people were shot dead by General Dyer um, because he thought they were resisting the Raj and actually they were just there, you know, hanging out, really. And um, it was going there that made me realise that the Indians knew lots about empire the average man on the street knew about Johnny Wallabarg. And yet over here, the average man on the street not only doesn't know about Johnny Wallabarg, and not only do British Sikhs often not know about Johnny Wallabarg, but they don't know about British Empire, even though it's one of the biggest things we ever did, you know, covered a quarter of the planet, biggest empire in human history. Um, I managed to learn almost nothing during my supposedly excellent education about empire. And that's not untypical. I mean, I've heard from so many Oxbridge history graduates who didn't have any teaching on empire. And it seems to be a common form of amnesia in this country. So sometimes the best way to fill the gaps in your knowledge is to write a book, which is which is what I did. A great journalist answer. And I should say yeah. to everyone watching, I really want to be able to put some of your questions to Satnam. It's quite important that we have a chance for him to set out some of the really interesting ideas in the book. But you can submit your questions using the Q&A button. Um, and if you could make sure if your question is related to a specific point in our conversation, could you just give the context rather than what did you mean, for example? Um, and we'll try and uh, bring the uh, your questions into it. Uh, in the sort of latter half hour. Um, I want to bring up one of my favourite moments in the book, because what you do basically is you you look at what we're not taught about empire, where you look at things like the, the idea of Empire Day, which was this big holiday, um, and you sort of analyse both what is missing, but also how it's shaped who we are today, including the English character. But I wanted to start by asking about a key moment that you explore in the book, which is um, the Tibet exhibition expedition sorry the tibet expedition to conquer that country in 1903 um because moments of military brutality you know a regular part of of um, british colonial history um 
tell me about how watching television one day made a connection to the Tibet expedition and what it revealed. I quite like the way you describe, describe it as <laughs> exhibition because it did actually, that was ultimately one of the motivating factors because the British in 1903 didn't know anything about Tibet. A, a white person had not gone. It was like North Korea in 1903. And the British were obsessed because Tibet, you know, was right at the edge of British Empire. And it was one of the areas between the th great threat of Russia and India. And the British were really interested in Tibet, not only because for political reasons, but for cultural reasons. You know, they, they wanted to find out more. And the British were already, you know, setting up museums and kind of were world experts in the world. And essentially what happened in 1903 is that they launched an expedition into uh, Tibet, which was basically a war. They decided to invade Tibet for the most spurious reasons. And I think this, the reason was ultimately is that when they arrived with loads of machine guns, the Tibetans sort of resisted, even though they had barely any weapons. And that was enough of a reason to engage them in battle. And so they, they murdered, I think, 3,000 Tibetans who were unarmed or had very few arms with machine guns and then looted the place. And uh, the reason I tell this story is that often there's an argument that we shouldn't apply modern morals to the past. But the thing is, it was very controversial at the time. You know, it was against the law at the time because we had the Geneva Convention, which declared that looting and pillaging was illegal. And there was outrage at the time. But the, I mean, the reason I, I, mean, I, was, I was reading about all of this and uh, I was beginning to think about writing a book and I was watching Flog It one day, which is a daytime TV favorite of mine as a freelancer. And there was a guy who came on with some Tibetan items and they looked about 100 years old. And I immediately recognized them as being from that expedition. And uh, the valuer gave them quite a low value. And I immediately knew they're going to be worth much more. But the narrative of the program followed these items. It turned out that these items that his grandfather apparently just found lying on the floor in Tibet. He, he apparently ended up having loads of them. Uh, funny how he found so many things just lying on the floor in the snow. And it turned out to generate the highest uh, auction amount the program had ever got. I think it was up to 200,000 pounds. And it just shows you how these items from Empire, you know, have ended up everywhere. They're in our museums, they're in our houses. They're on our daytime TV, and we don't really remember how we got them. And there's a disconnect. It's also um, that sense of, um, like, it's like bad taste. People don't like being asked about stuff that's been in their family for a while. And I think that's one of the ideas that you deal with very wonderfully in the book, which is you kind of put your finger on the areas that people that people get upset about when you raise them. Um, and I thought that was quite powerful and um, you're also very good at I mean I've talked about this whole experience of reading your book as being a bit like the, the famous red pill moment in the matrix when once you've suddenly become aware of all this stuff that people are bringing on antique shows that their, their ancestors just found on the ground you realize hang on that's a euphemism for for imperial um, looting um, in the National Dictionary of Biography, which is, of course, you know, kind of it's like a who's who for famous dead people. You notice the language codes about how people are described in there, too. Can you give me some examples? Yeah, I mean, off the top of my head, it's the it's the way they describe, um, you know, people involved in slavery. So they, they talk about things like uh, landowner, you know, maybe plantation owner, but it's all euphemisms. It's very rarely owner of slaves or slave trader, you know what I mean? It's Held like, extensive property in Jamaica. That's the phrase, yes. And actually one of the things that really surprised me is that when all this money was coming over to Britain from slavery and from India, the thing that the aristocrats hated was the money from India because they could understand plantation owners and landowners because that's what they did. Uh, yeah, the money from India was the, the equivalent of Russian money today. You know, we, we, we don't quite trust it. And so people like Robert Clive and Warren Hastings, who became very rich from going to India, they were the ones who were hated, whereas the slavery money was kind of tolerated. And uh, I guess that's almost that's reversed, hasn't it, in the modern age? We now tend to look at dismay with at slavery money, don't we? No, it's interesting. Um, you 
you know, mentioned or hinted at the kind of the country house. And again, there's a wonderful section in your book where you look at the country house as a symbol of, um, well, it's a kind of money laundering of the, the riches, particularly from places like India. Can you tell us a bit about what you found in your research? Yeah, I guess the National Trust have been doing this uh, quite controversially. They published a report looking at the colonial legacies of, of country houses. But one of the things that these nabobs, who were these men who made billions from India and came over, what, one of the things they all did was buy country houses because that owning land and those estates gave you, you know, put you on the first step to getting a seat in parliament. And it also it was a way of arriving socially as well. And Robert Clive, I think, bought a dozen houses, you know, he he just cleared up. He bought half of Shropshire and then a bit of Wales as well and a massive house in Belgravia. And similarly with slave money, so many plant, so many aristocrats already who already had houses were involved in the plantations. And yeah, I mean, this was where colonial cash was laundered and often they concealed the sources of their wealth. There's one or two houses that exist now, like Sezincote, in the Cotswolds, that's very honest about where the money came from because that was set up by a nabob, built by a nabob. And if you go there, it's almost built like an Indian house. You know, it's got a Mughal onion dome. But in general, people built English Georgian houses and occasionally had Indian furniture. But as time went on further, the families concealed the sources of their wealth. You know, you can go to most of those houses now and have no idea, you know, about the imperial sources a wealth of why these houses were built in the first place. Hence the controversy now that when the National Trust points it out, people get very cross. They're going, why are you pointing out the, the colonial heritage of these houses? Because I just want to go and eat my scones in peace. You know? And I, I kind of get that mentality, but I, I think the National Trust exists to explore heritage. Yeah. And colonial history is British history. It is when it's expanding our knowledge rather than diminishing it. Um, one of the early chapters of the book deals with Empire Day, which is something that I used to hear referred to, but had sort of died out by the time that I think you know you and I were were at school. What was Empire Day, and what did you discover by looking at its history? Because I think you have a theory about how we could somehow reinvent it for modern Britain. Yeah, absolutely, but in a in a kind of Empire Awareness Day uh, kind of way. Yeah, no, I mean. Empire Day is a strange institution I actually never heard of. Um, it was set up by Earl Meath, and um, he campaigned for years, and he finally got established as a national school holiday uh, in the middle of World War I, when there was, you know, patriotic, patriotic feeling was at its height. And it was a half day for school kids, but generally the whole country celebrated it. You know, companies had gatherings, uh, the owner of Selfridges, got the staff on the top of the roof of Selfridges and they put up a flag and sang the national anthem. There were parades, the Daily Express sponsored an annual parade where kids were arranged in colors to represent the Union Jack, an idea that I think Robert Jenrick would love today. Um, there were people doing, marching through towns, you know, dressed up as people from different colonies in blackface sometimes, holding the ingredients that, that come from Australia or India or the Caribbean, and it was an acknowledgement or celebration of all things empire because Earl Meath felt that we weren't proud enough and felt that if we weren't proud, we were going to lose touch with the empire. And I actually think we should have something like that now, but not for the same reasons, not to celebrate empire, but to remember how it has created us. Because let's face it, you know, so many things about us nowadays can be explained by empire, not least you and I, Samira, the reason we're here, two brown people, in Britain is because of empire. And I think even we forget sometimes. Um, I mean, I wonder if there was an overlap period where it became Commonwealth Day. So I think Commonwealth Day still exists and the Queen does events. I remember being taken to the Commonwealth Institute as a child. It's now um, the Design Museum. It was an incredible um, sort of scallop shell shaped building. The building is still the best thing about it. Uh, but what was lovely walking in was the sense of it was all the you know former colonies and there were sections on, you know, cocoa grown in Ghana and lambs from Australia. And you had this weird sense of um, this was an attempt to give a positive post-colonial identity, which acknowledged the racial diversity. But like we're all in a club together now because we choose to be. Um, and that that idea has kind of gone now. You know, there's there's a more vision and I think about it but I wonder what you make of 
that concept of the Commonwealth and how far that could be the basis of something positive out of all this. Yeah, no, no, I think you're right. I think Commonwealth Day did take over from Empire Day. I don't know if he's still on the same date because it was on Queen Victoria's birthday, May the 24th originally. I don't know if that's still the case. Yeah, maybe they've changed it. Yeah, maybe the date's changed, but it is meant to be a legacy. And But the connection is a, is a really interesting one because people often say to me, look, if the colonies, the former colonies, hated empire so much, why did they join the Commonwealth? You know, they, they, some people see the membership of the Commonwealth as approval of empire. And I've not consulted the terms and conditions of joining the Commonwealth, but I'm pretty sure there weren't a, a kind of an agreement that everything about empire was good. I think they'd be quite, members of the Commonwealth would be quite surprised about that. I mean, the Commonwealth nowadays, I think really struggles to have a meaning. And what does it mean beyond, you know, the Commonwealth games? I mean, I have, I don't really know. And, uh, you could argue that some of the arguments we have about Brexit and economics and trade are a legacy of that, because there's been a, a fetishization amongst Brexiteers about developing re intimate relationships with the former white colonies in particular. We've Australian. got a trade deal with Australia, Sattler. Exactly. And during empire, that fetishization existed. You know, people would often say, look, there is this thing called the English race. And if you're a member of you're a citizen of Australia, you should be a citizen of Britain. But they didn't, almost always, they didn't extend that to the brown members of empire. I think that idea persists. You know, it's interesting. When I was working at The Guardian, um, I was doing a student um, attachment, and it was around the time that there was a lot of talk about the end of apartheid. This was um, 18, uh, early 1990. And I, I did this research into... Um, there was a real concern in the UK about the number of white South Africans who could claim British um, nationality and citizenship through patrilineal sense because you'd have white grandfather. <laughs> I remember the Guardian headline was one million whites may flood into Britain, which was such a Guardian take on the story. But it was really interesting because it was one of those first moments where you suddenly presented what was apparent, you know, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand as and Canada. Um, as this quartet with Britain, who had a special inner circle of the Commonwealth, which I thought was interesting. Um, you've also hinted very nicely of, of one of the other issues when you talked about um, Brexit. And I was thinking about treaties and agreements, which is, you know, there's a huge history. And I'm someone who read a lot of Indian history as a child in comic book form. And anyone of Indian heritage on here may have grown up reading the Amachitrakatha comics, uh, which dealt with episodes like the Rani of Jhansi and the Indian uprising, or uh, Indian mutiny, as it was called, um, where you know the British would make treaties and then find an excuse to tear them up and annex kingdoms. And I'm not um, saying it's the same, but I was very interested to see the way that the row over the Northern Ireland Protocol has unfolded in the recent days and weeks with the British government saying, well, we're asking the EU to be more reasonable. And the EU is saying, well, this is the agreement that was negotiated over years. And that's one of the sort of, it's a mindset thing, isn't it, that you talk about in your book and how the British political system and its, its figures think and operate. Yeah, I mean, uh, Jeremy Paxman in his book on empire talks about how every prime minister in our lifetime has had an imperial tone of voice. And, you know, it's really obvious the ways in which Boris Johnson is imperial. You know, he went to Bailey Hall, which produced a lot of, off, you know, leaders of empire. He, you know, has quite imperial language, talking about flag-waving piccaninis. He wants to read out Roger Kipling poems when he goes to Myanmar. But arguably, Tony Blair was equally imperial not necessarily using the same language, but in the way, the assumption that us invading countries like Afghanistan and Iraq is good for them. And also in the way he, you know, he just assumed that we mattered. You know, every, we're a tiny country and we still talk about other countries' problems as if they are our own. And that goes straight back to empire, doesn't it? I mean, it's... Uh, it's in our psyche, isn't it? It's Although the counter would be that it's perhaps it's a sense of positive acknowledgement of responsibility in some way, in the same way that Macron talks about French responsibility in, say, Lebanon or Mali. Yeah, I mean, there is that argument. Um, but I mean, I, I, in the book, I pick up on some press commentary on what, around Iraq. And uh, I mean, literally, I think we had... I can't remember the name of the person who wrote that column. There's two of them, Max Boot in the Wall Street Journal. 
and uh, someone else arguing that actually what Afghanistan needed was a viceroy, you know, and looking at Tony Blair's language. And he was more or less saying that. He was like, look, it's for their own good that we're taking over. And But the problem with Tony Blair is that he didn't have a very good sense of history. I mean, I don't think he was aware that Britain had got involved in Afghanistan disastrously in, during empire. And also my, one of my favorite examples of imperial amnesia is in Tony Blair's autobiography, where he talks about handing back Hong Kong to the Chinese and says, you know what? I was only dimly aware of the history. And you can bet that every Chinese person at school learns about the opium wars. And yet we can have a, a well-read prime minister who doesn't know about them, I know, and, and that's just incredible. I know. Over the Opium Wars is, is one of the great atrocities of, um, of British imperial history, and I only read about it in the last decade. I think it's very significant. And it also contributes to the strange situation we're in now, where, you know, Britain is offering asylum to hundreds of thousands, if not more than a million Hong Kongers. Um, and China is behaving in this way that is you know, causing great concern. But if you go back and see the complicated history, you know, um, it's basically it's not easy. It's not as simple as one side is good and the other side is bad. No, absolutely. Um, now, and, yeah, I mean, that's certainly it. Britain seems to be behaving incredibly honorably now over that issue. Totally. And I've, I mean, there's some, been some articles in the FT about the Hong Kong Chinese. And you know what? There's genuine nostalgia for British Empire there. And you can see why. And so, yeah, it is complicated. I mean, I've got no time for people who just say everything about empire is bad. And I've got no time for people who say everything about empire is good. I think the only rational intellectual response is to say it was really complicated. Yeah. Um, one of the other great things in your book is the way you, you talk more broadly about the British character. I mean, you talked a little bit about um, a certain attitude in politics, but the cult of amateurism is something that comes out of empire. Can you tell us about that? Amateurism, or are you talking about anti-intellectual? Well, I suppose I was I was conflating the two. Mm. Um, yes, maybe it's anti-intellectualism. Yeah, I think yeah, there's elements of amateurism in it as well. But essentially, there was a man, I think his name was First, who, who was responsible for the colonial service and recruitment in places like Sudan. And he had a preference for Oxbridge students who got a third. I mean, and that dictated the culture of the way at the height of empire we recruited people in empire because you wanted someone who's smart but not so smart they would question what they were doing and people who just carried out orders you know and that is a great tradition in britain i think there's a certain anti-intellectual thing in our public life i mean look at boris johnson you know he speaks four languages at least he's bilingual at the very least and yet when he speaks french on tv he puts on this franglais accent because he doesn't want to look clever. And similarly with his whole bumbling buffoon thing. And I mean, there's so many examples. Keir Starmer, one of the criticisms of him is that he's too clever. David Willits, he was called Two Brains. Remember that? And he, I think he gave an interview where he said that destroyed his career because he was, he was regarded as a dangerous intellectual, you know. And I think this is, it goes throughout life. I don't know if you remember doing exams at school and at my grammar school, even though everyone was there because they were supposedly clever, the worst thing you could do was to show that you'd done a lot of revising. What, Wasn't that culturally specific? I felt that all the Asian kids who got into these schools weren't mm. afraid of showing they worked hard. And um, I mean, I don't mean to be sweepingly general, but I, I'd never come across the idea that you would act as if you'd done no revision and that it yeah. was something to be proud of. And yeah, then no, to have somehow managed to pull off a bunch of A's. That seemed to me com something completely alien to me, having grown up in a British Asian home. Oh, you know, I was definitely like that initially, because the British Asian thing, especially with our parents, is to go on and on about how hard it was. You know what I mean? Your parents going, you don't know how hard it was. And then you working really hard. But I think as part of my integration that I actually I had absorbed that kind of public school attitude of never showing I was working very hard. I mean, we yeah, at school. You went to an all male ex public school that had become a grammar. Oh, sorry, yeah. a grammar that had become a private school, and you'd got in just before and were kept there on a scholarship, mm. weren't you? Yeah, and so at school we used to get a, a grade for our effort and then a number for our attainment, and everyone wanted to get an E one because it showed that you put no effort and yet you were a genius. And I would say Boris Johnson is totally that, although I'd give him an E three. <laughs> 
probably. I think it's also, I would argue it's particularly male, but then that's partly the history of empire. The other thing I wondered, and I, I don't know if it's, it applies more generally, I think going back decades, which is the appointment of people who somehow have the right connection and are willing. So um, the idea that, and I remember being, you know, Dido Harding's doing it for free. Mm. is somehow a huge mark in her favour. And the number of appointments like this, if you look at the people who've been appointed to oversee a new investigation of the BBC, you know, um, it's it's the, the great and the good. And I think the concept of the great and the good feeds back, doesn't it, to um, the idea of empire rewarding the, sort of the, the deserving of the English system. Yeah, I mean, it was an, an elitist thing. And the, the Victorian public school system, you know, was shaped around empire. The idea was to create a kind of, superclass of people who would run empire and in turn the public school system had a massive influence in the state education system and i would i would argue it still does a lot of our conservative education reforms are about making the state sector more like the public school sector and i would say the public school sector has a massive you know hold over our political elite well it clearly does doesn't it psychologically but also in just sheer numbers there are so many great questions coming in. I'm going to start taking some of them. I can um, see some of them. Yeah, so Rosalind Clayton, I was going to, are you happy if I pick them in? The, yeah, in the, pick them out. Oh, yeah, unless you want to. Um, so Rosalind Clayton says, is it time to stop the order of the British Empire, British Empire Medal, replace them with something else or just abolish honours altogether? And two uh, things I'd add to that is, of course, there's been a new round of honours, including people like Lem Sisse, um, who's of um, you know African heritage and part African heritage and grew up treated appallingly in the care system. And equally, I know there's a campaign of people to say we need to replace the word empire with excellence it's as simple as that what is mm. what are your thoughts actually i have i have i i, I have a quite uh, probably unusual opinion on this in that i i don't mind it because i feel like empire explains who we are as a i am imperial the reason i'm here is because britain conquered parts of india you know the reason we're a multicultural society is because of empire the reason we have racism of our particular variety is because of empire and trying to take out empire is like trying to take out you know the egg from a baked cake and so i actually quite like the fact that the, these honors acknowledge our history when the you know millions of troops from empire lay down their lives for this country for british empire i i mean i don't see the problem in people being getting a, uh, rewards in the, in the name of empire. If anything, it's more honest than the fact that we normally ignore that empire even happened, you know? So I, I, I respect people who say no, I can see their reasoning, but I don't think they've thought about it deeply enough. Yeah, so you would describe Benjamin Zephaniah, who of course yeah. famously on Channel 4 News talked uh, Yasmin Alibi Brown into returning her MBE. Because yeah, I mean, I respect them, I understand it. Did Some not acknowledge the wrongdoing. Totally. And it's like massacres, genocides happened in the name of empire. But it also explains who we are. As a British Sikh, it explains our whole community in that the way we see ourselves as a martial race was created by the British Empire. The British Sikh, the Sikh community in India was dying off before the British decided to make us this martial race. I mean, our numbers increased. It's why we're here in Britain. So for me, as a British Sikh, you know, I feel like it's, it's honest. To, to use the word empire it kind of it starts the conversation but equally i understand why people want to say no yeah, yeah i should say there's already a couple of comments in the q a where uh, i think it, i think this is fair to say uh, you know a sort of asking about is there anything at all about britain you actually like or admire these are questions you get a lot aren't they i have tried not to get i mean are they implying that i'm if i hate britain so much i should get back to where i came from <laughs> well, you know, I think, yeah, I think they feel it's a denigration and um, and a surprise that they, yeah, anyway, I think it's interesting to acknowledge that there are always questions like this um, coming up. Um, yeah, yeah. But I, I'll be honest, I don't think they're fair questions, given the nature of our conversation. Um, yeah, we get this all the time as brown people. I mean, the thing is, when you're talking about empire, you're talking about race, you know, you're talking about white people conquering brown people. And the reason you often get people saying oh why you know you should be more grateful and what that implies is that you know we're not british you know if i was white i don't i simply do not get wouldn't get those questions it's because yeah, so there's an idea that you're about an empire and about the questions raised by it not mm. about all the great things that we love about britain 
totally. I love Britain. Such as scones, which have already been mentioned. Yeah, I love Britain. I think if you care about your country, you ask ask searching questions. It's like you can adore your mother and still say that her cooking skills are a crime against humanity. It's because you're you not talking her. about your mother there, I know. No, I'm not. No. It's because you care that you're having yeah. an argument with her, you know, and it's similarly with Britain. Yeah. You know, I love this country, but it's because I care that I'm, I've spent four years of my life thinking about it. Yeah. I want to quote Hilary Mantel to you. I interviewed her the other day on Front Row, and I would recommend people go and listen to it. It was on um, Thursday's Front Row. She's just won the Walter Scott Prize for historical fiction, and she does all the research. And then she imagines stuff. And obviously she's a novelist, not a historian, but she said this when um, I was asking about the legacy that she hoped for her books. Let me just find it. Um, where did I write it? Oh, well, I'll have to summarize it. But she basically said, we're not taught stuff in schools properly. And I would encourage everyone, everyone has learned to be skeptical about the version of Thomas Cromwell that they were taught. Um, and I, you know, I'm really pleased with that. Um, but basically, a lot of what we were taught in schools does not hold up. And um, historians are always challenging and, and do what they can to find it. And we should all apply those skills, whether we are talking about reading about the past or even what's going on now. I thought that was interesting. And I'll just read you a, an audience question because there's so many good questions related to it. Claire McMenamin asks, you're spot on about the absence of colonial history in our own education. Do you know where we are currently with proposals to rectify this in the future curriculum? So if we separate off the issue of what we're taught and then mm. the second half would be do you have any thoughts about how we might make this better? I'm glad you mentioned Hiro Mantel. Um, I think she's our modern day Shakespeare. I, love, I think she's the best writer we have. And actually, I remember her saying something else about her research in that she says, you read a lot and then you end up using 2% of your research in the book. And I feel the same, having writ written a vaguely historical novel. And actually, even Empire Land, I would say I've used a fraction of what I've read. Um, in terms of teaching, Things are a bit better than they were in our day. You know, key stage three requires the teaching of empire. But, you know, we're talking about two or three years there. You're trying to cover 500 years. The level of the teaching varies widely from school to school. And also, um, if you're an academy or a private school, you don't have to follow the national curriculum. And that can be good or bad. Some private schools and academies are brilliant at teaching empire and some just ignore it ent entirely. So I guess you've got a situation now where things are a bit better, but still it's wildly inconsistent. I visited a school last week where they knew even less than I did at their age, which I was really shocked by because I thought things had got better. Um, the problem is empires in the middle of a culture war. And so the politicians just won't agree. I mean, and recently we had Jeremy Corbyn saying, we need to teach the crimes of empire in schools. And then you had Michael Gove saying a few years beforehand, we need to teach the achievements of empire. And I think neither is the way to do it. We just need to learn how to talk about empire, you know, and the nuance. What's really great in your book is you talk about how often at the time of, of events that are now historical, um, you gave the example of the Tibet expedition. There was outrage. These things were considered crimes at the time. There were questions asked in Parliament. Um, they were reported in the newspapers as being, you know, terrible, um, um, you know, atrocities. So it's strange in a way, or it's useful to remember that some of the current um, backlash against um, questioning these events is entirely contemporary. And it's, you know, people at the time were far more honest about it. Um, let me give you another question, which um, is good. Bill Green, is the British Empire really the English Empire? And when we say we, um, and when we say we talk about collective Britishness, do we really mean all British nationals or English? And I know that's something I've mentioned to you in the past. It's pretty really striking the scale of Scottish and Irish people who went out as administrators of the British Empire, huge numbers who were involved in enforcing the slave trade and some of, you know, and the military in particular in places like India. Um, yeah, so this is a very awkward point for Scottish nationalists and Welsh nationalists and Irish nationalists that they were involved. In empire. I mean, in Alex Renton's new book, where he confronts his own Scottish aristocratic family's involvement in, in slavery, he discovers that actually the Scots were disproportionately involved in slavery. You know, they were compensated more than the English, which is doesn't go into the narrative of Scottish nationalism, where they're the victims of English colonialism. 
is complicated, but I would say that today the Scottish and the Welsh and the Irish are much better at teaching empire and confronting it. I think already in the Welsh national curriculum, you have teaching of black history. You know, it's part of their curriculum. Whereas That's really interesting because I know talking to um, writers and figures of, you know, sort of mixed heritage in places like Scotland, I think there's been some nervousness about the rise of um, elements of Scottish nationalism and how um, some, some people in some of these um, nations of the United Kingdom have selectively deployed a sense of their own victimhood, victims of English empire. While actually, if you look at the real history, you look at the history of someone like Dundee, for example, and the wealth that was created there, um, it's, <laughs> it wasn't um, the English did everything. Um, I think that's really interesting. Totally. And, and Glasgow was the second city of empire. I mean, it owes so much of its wealth to slavery and empire. And um, Robert Burns famously was going to become a slave driver. Did you know that? Famously was going to become a slave driver, was, a was a poor farmer. And it was only, he, I think he missed his ship and ended up being a poet. But it could have gone in a very different direction. I mean, part of what's really fantastic about colonial history when you start looking into it is all the positives. So, you know, people talk about how the slave trade was often discussed in schools as William Wilberforce and a bunch of nice white people freed um, you know, helped uh, end slavery. And actually there's been this completely uh, deliberate decision not to write about the great, I always talk about the great uh, Jamaican slave uprising of 1830, which was a direct trigger for legislation to end it as well as the long-term movements. But then there are wonderful things like the long-term movement led by the Quakers, which resonates into the present day about the, the principles of people um, with who, who stood up to imperial oppression within the English system. And there's a question that goes with it, which is um, David and Karen Watts, um, who've just bought um, your book. Um, Thank you. <laughs> um, does it deal with how British working class lives are affected by empire if they never left the country, so were never directly involved in creating it? And I think you do talk about the role of working class people in mill towns in particular in the campaigning against slavery, don't you? Yeah, I'd talk a bit. I, I could. There's definitely whole books to be written about this because, um, you know, there's an argument made that the working classes were never particularly engaged in empire. The level of knowledge was quite low and... I mean, some people go as far as saying the working classes was treated as badly as the colonized. I mean, some people go as far as saying, you know, they were slaves were treated, you know, better than some of the working classes in Britain, which is clearly not the case. No, there's enough know. evidence that it survived, despite all the records that were destroyed in these um, colonized um, countries to show that's really not true. That's not true. But mm -hmm. I mean, there's a big argument to make that actually the working classes of Britain were very much on side. Mm -hmm with the colonized and that maybe British Empire was an elite obsession. Right, we go to uh, the next one, let's have a look here. Um, I'm just gonna go back to my question list for a moment before I take more, but do keep submitting your questions to the, um, in the um, Q and A button. Sorry, I've got too many windows open. <laughs> I'm just trying to shuffle my script around. Common problem. Come back. Right, can I move this up without causing a problem? There we go. Right, okay, one of the things I'm interested in is, I went to see a play last night, Tanika Gupta, one of our brilliant young playwrights, um, and it's, she wrote a play called The Overseas Student, which was inspired by um, Gandhi as a young 19-year-old law student coming to Britain for the first time. And what would have been, he lived off the um, Barons, he lived on the Barons Court Road and in Hammersmith and what he would have encountered. And of course, so many of these post-colonial leaders, that first generation, were educated in Britain and were encouraged to some extent to see themselves as, um, you know, Asian versions of white colonial leaders. And I know that you don't devote a huge amount of time to it. You must have thought about the impact of that on the whole ruling class of a lot of um, mm. countries that were once part of the British Empire. That's a very good point. I've just actually read a book last week by Ian Sanjay Patel, where he lists all the post-colonial leaders who had Oxbridge education. I mean, Indira Gandhi, there are loads in Africa as Jamal, well. Nehru. Wetaro yeah, I mean, it's and incredible. Oxford. And actually, I think about, I thought about this a lot in that, in relation to my own education, which I feel colonized me in a, in a certain way, in the sense that I didn't read a single Brown author until my final term, a final year at Cambridge, which says a lot. And actually, when you look at, 
what happened in India, a lot of the Indian kingdoms, they weren't conquered for the final time on the battlefield. They were conquered in the classroom in that the young princes were almost always sent into a British education system. And that's how they, they became British and that's how they ultimately were conquered. And education was used as a tool of colonization. It happened, definitely happened with the Sikh empire. Yes, in that, the I've heard there's been Singh. some good documentaries. I think there was one done by um, the, um, Radio One DJ. So Bobby Friction did a documentary about one of the Sikh princes who was mm. um, basically raised on his own, completely separated from his family. I don't know if he was orphaned, but I was thinking in a weird way, it's like the, uh, it's a version of, you know, that, those terrible um, stories like coming out of Canada now, the numbers of children of indigenous peoples who were just, and in Australia as well, and they were taken away from their parents and put into these state boarding schools to strip them of their culture. And although they seem completely separate, they're part of the same idea, which is you have completely sterilized all the cultural connectivity mm. of an individual from their tribe. Well, the and British were equal opportunists about this because they did this to their own children because they routinely the people, British people living in empire would almost always send their kids back to Britain to be schooled over here because they didn't trust the Indian or the African education system. And they felt that there was something morally dangerous about being around those people at, at that influential age. So they went through this awful separation and, um, you know, people were traumatized by it. But again, it was deemed essential, a part of empire that they went through this experience. Great question from uh, Jeremy uh, Rodell. Is there a way to promote recognition of the empire egg in the modern British cake, the analogy you used, while avoiding the feeling that some people have that a valuable part of their personal national identity is somehow being threatened? I think that's really well expressed, Jeremy. Yeah, and it's, it's difficult because there's an idea which is being propounded by right wing elements of the Conservative Party at the moment that in order to be proud of being British, you need to be proud of all our history, particularly the colonial history, which is a really stupid way of looking at 500 years of complex history. You can't, it's like saying you're proud of ginger or the weather or the sunshine. You know what I mean? What does that mean? I mean, are you proud of abolition? Are you proud of slavery? Are you proud of Samira Ahmed? Are you proud of, you know, the fact that British Airways originally called it Imperial Airways? And it's too complicated. You can't reduce 500 years of history to like a, a podcast where you're reviewing on Spotify and giving it a rating out of five. Yeah. Um, but this has been the narrative about British Empire for at least 10 years. And I blame Niall Ferguson, who started it all by saying, you know, did he start and maybe he didn't start it but he had a big role in this balance sheet view of empire the idea that you can weigh everything up the massacres against the railways and whatever and come to a, a conclusion that in the end empire was good or bad it was also it's odd that he used because i remember reviewing one of his books on the um whatever that late review show was called and he, he had one of the things about you know well the british gave the world treaties and said, but they ripped up most of the ones they made with you know other nations um who were you know the countries they eventually conquered so how is this possibly um a positive but it, again it was quite a selective thing i was just surprised that he would claim that one um adrian widowson asks do you think the government's line on protecting our history is an attempt to counter critical thinking I mean, you've you said that the answer is we just need, you know, we just need to be more open and just continue teaching the bigger picture of history. But it is really interesting, isn't it? Because if, if and a lot of people are commenting about critical thinking is at the heart of what good education is mm. supposed to be about. So what is going on with this government? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually looking into this because I'm, I'm updating my book for paperback and there's something very interesting going on. I think, I mean, there's a guy called Douglas Smith who's an advisor to the Conservative Party, who has basically decided that having this culture war is beneficial for the Conservative Party in that they want to you know, keep hold of these voters in the middle of working class voters who are left wing economically, but right wing when it comes to this you know, kind of nationality and identity politics. And so playing these games to have someone like Oliver Dowden, who was actually a Remainer and a liberal mm -hmm. saying, you know, we need to protect British history, you know, having loads of British flags everywhere. This really apparently works in focus groups. It kind of solidifies the re report. And this argument, I think, 
it's true because, you know, when the Tories talk about this stuff, it's almost always in certain newspapers, the Sunday Telegraph, mainly, or the Mail. And it's aimed at their own right wingers. Do you think and, it's a certain age demographic as well? Yeah, it's aimed at, you know, it's aimed at a particular strand of voters. But I think, I mean, Samuel, is it Kosamudu, who's their race, race advisor who resigned over this issue, was saying, you know what? They can play these culture wars, but it's very negative in that you cause division. And that's what my that's what my worry is, in that when you have these culture wars, it's it, it conveys a message to multicultural Britain, you know, to people like you and I, that you know, imperial history is not British history, that there's only one way of looking at it, and we are the children of the colonized. And want- I think it creates division. Sorry, I was going to say, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you're writing an update for the paperback. And I keep saying this to political journalists, so I'm going to say it to you because it's relevant to your book. I think you need to look at the Australian political experience of the last 15 years. I think what we're going through now, more even than, it's not so much that it's Trumpian. We've literally got some of the same political advisors, but there's something about the rhetoric. And you look at Australia and mm. the divisions, that are being, and it's a very multicultural society now, as we know, but of course its history is um, very complicated because of empire and... Um, with the Aboriginal people in particular. And I just wonder if you might find some answers there. Yeah, okay. it's happening everywhere, though. It's happening in India. Modi's trying well, to... Well, that's another question. So do you want to move mm. on to that? Nationalism mm. seems to be such a problem in many countries. Sorry, I'm trying... here we go. I'll, um, this is rad. Um, isn't nationalism a real problem today? Um, don't we want less adversarial politics for the nation as the political unit and more cooperative arrangements, perhaps similar to the EU? But, you know, you're right. You look mm. at India... Um, you could look at a great many countries around the world, Hungary, Poland, um, Brazil, Poland, um, what, and yeah. Russia. What are your thoughts about? Yeah, and America Trump's attempts to introduce a patriotic education. I don't, I don't know if you kept up with that, but one of the first things Biden did was to cancel that, you know. But yeah, it's an it's a international issue. Nationalism, I would say these conservatives on the right wing of the Conservative Party are English nationalists. That's what it's about, isn't it? It's not a British thing. Because the more they do this culture war, I think the worse it goes down in Scotland and Wales. I mean, I've talked to mm. people from both countries in the last few weeks. And yeah, and it doesn't, it doesn't play well in those countries. And you're, I, the irony is in talking up empire, you could be ending the union, you know? And maybe the ultimate act of decolonization will be when these right-wing English nationalists destroy Britain and we end up with just England standing alone. I mean, that's the worst case scenario. I hope we snap out of this culture war. And it, it depresses me in particular because Boris Johnson became elected as a London mayor on a very positive, you know, kind of election manifesto. It was very inclusive. Well, his race it? advisor, in the, after he did the interview to The Guardian, talked mm-hmm. about how well they got on and how um, he felt Boris Johnson really understood a lot of issues um yeah and his kids are i think a quarter sikh you know his ex-wife is half sikh and he's got very international background but this is what happens if you start cynically playing the focus group game you know i struggle to know what boris johnson's about you know because he said extreme opposites maybe it's deliberate you know we had dominic coming saying look he's got all the direction of a shopping trolley and he likes the chaos because when there's chaos people look to the leader I think that's dangerous. And I feel like throughout my lifetime, whoever's been in charge, even if I've hated them, has tried to be inclusive and try, has tried to bring the nation together. But now we have dangerous people in charge who are deliberately sowing division because it worked well with Brexit. Mm, well, it feels like it's all driven by a kind of an election kind mm. of strategy. And I think it's legitimate to say this government seems to have kept in election mode, in a sense, ever since um, Boris Johnson became prime minister. Question from Paul Hughes. The way the history of empires is taught in Britain strikes me as bizarre. For example, the Spanish empire is held up as an example of evil, and the British empire is how imperialism is done properly. Do you see all empires as a mix of good and bad? That's a great observation, Paul. I was taught that at school. We learned a lot about the evil Spanish empire. It's important to remember that British empire, although it's the biggest ever, was not the only empire and actually the nation state is quite a new invention you know empires was generally how the world has been ordered for quite a long time i think and in terms also... of genocides the british haven't carried out as many as the spanish <laughs> yeah that's i think that's a 
quite a depressing conversation to work genocides. But we had a genocide in Tasmania. Which well, is I was now, thinking of Tasmania, yeah, I know. And now is being denied by a certain person who I won't mention um, by name. Don't want to give him publicity. But yeah, it's really important to remember that there have been other empires. And also, I think there's something natural to want to believe the best about your empire. I mean, there was a Sikh empire, and you won't mean, meet many Sikhs who will say, the Sikh Empire was anything other than cosmopolitan and brilliant and peaceful and loving. And there was a survey out a few months ago, which uh, asked people in the Holland and Belgium and France and Germany how they felt about their empires. And the Dutch were actually even more nostalgic than us. We were second. But the Dutch the were even more nostalgic. And it just goes to show you that you want to believe the best about your history, don't you? Do you know what's really interesting? I interviewed Bart van Es, who wrote this amazing book, The Cut-Out Girl, about, um, mm, know you know, um, a sort of, she was a, a Jewish child who was taken and protected by his family. But of mm. course, the Netherlands handed over and nearly all their Jews to the Nazis. They were very, very willing collaborators. And I think, I suspect one could find some interesting um, correlations between empire and how people have behaved. I'm not saying a correlation is the same as a kind of direct connection, but um, or causation. But I think it's interesting. Belgium as well. Oh, that's very good. And I love that book. I was actually on the Costa panel when we gave it book of the year, I think. Oh, he came um, on the front row when he won. And book. if you haven't read it, it's a book about um, his family history. This girl who's cut out of family photos, but had mm. actually been taken in and protected by them through the war. And he had grandparents who were part of a very small network of people helping Jews. Mm. I, th I think maybe in mainland Europe, they've generally been quite good at facing up to what happened in World War II, generally, although maybe Holland's an, an exception there. Um, that if maybe we all the European countries haven't been very good at confronting their own colonialism, it's because the colonies were abroad, you know, especially for Britain, where this island, it was probably completely possible, even at the height of empire in the late 19th century, to be a man on the street and not know anything about empire. I, I think there was a survey in 1947 where they asked British people how much they knew about empire. And the, the, the level of knowledge was very poor. I mean, there were a bunch of people who, who thought that Lincolnshire was a colony, you know. And so you could argue that we've never known about empire. And that's partly because empire is always far away. And that's why we've never had the confrontation with our history. We've never had to. It's not like the French after World War II, where they, we've had to face up to what we did because there's always somewhere else. Can I just say, it has actually contributed to some of the richest literature because it's been on the edge. So if you think about um, Jane Eyre and the first Mrs. Rochester, who's Creole, and is, there's a whole thing about the, the Caribbean money uh, and the corruption of it. Um, and the same in um, Mansfield Park. And I know there's, there's books written which imply that Jane Austen was actually actively putting in these coded messages about the, uh, slavery, which I'm, I'm not sure I buy into. But what's lovely is how part of the things that we are all proud of about being British, which is, a great literature is that sometimes it's the fact that empire was a way that it somehow still seeps into our imagination and it seeds some mm. of our greatest stories and we're still challenging through those books these books are so loved yeah i don't think it seeps into it enough because you know i was taught mansfield park at a level no one mentioned there was this massive debate going on about abolition about whether jane austen was pro or anti-abolition mm -hmm. no one mentioned that and a lot of the characters, their wealth comes from slavery. That would have made the book quite interesting for me. But similarly, we're taught endlessly about the Tudors and Henry VIII. No one told me there were black people in Henry VIII's court. There, there are some, were... And there's some great stories in your book where you find some of these amazing people who lived of, of black and Asian heritage in Ireland and Britain. Yeah, and there were, there were brown people on the Mary Rose. You know, Elizabeth I was complaining about there being too many black people in 1600. And... I think the first Bengali boy was born in 1616 in London. And we were just not taught this stuff. And, and most awfully is that millions of people from empire fought in both world wars. And I was never told that in any Remembrance Day service, in any MI education, we were deleted. You know, our ancestors didn't matter. And we've had the controversy recently with the Commonwealth Graves Commission where up to 350,000 people died. The population of Leicester died and their sacrifice wasn't celebrated in any form, not in stone, not in a register, nowhere, which says a lot about our imperial amnesia. Um, question um, that's 
coming from Rajan Chowdhury. He's chair of Sheffield Humanists. Do you think there's something specifically disturbing about British born people of colour whose families came from former colonies who don't really know that much about their own history? And uh, he says, I should say, I count myself among those who don't know that much. Um, I wouldn't pick them out because I, I was, I'm one of those people, you know, I, I knew nothing. I didn't even understand the basic fact about how the 1948 Nationality Act made citizens of empire, citizens of Britain. I didn't understand that lots of our, you know, grandparents and parents came here as citizens. You know, I absorbed the narrative that we came here uninvited to take advantage of British hospitality, because that's been the narrative in the media mm -hmm. for my whole life. And I, I agree. So I think knowledge of empire is poor in multicultural communities as well as the general population. I'm going to sneak in. I've been lots of thoughtful questions and comments, so thank you for them all. Brian GB says, in relation to introducing Empire Day, would it not be advantageous to Britain to start a process of peace and reconciliation? So I think this is going back to our point about, could we bring back Empire Day in a new form? Yeah, I mean, it'd be great to see that. It'd be great to see conversations about restitution and, and actually compensating people. But you know what? We're very far away in from having that conversation in this country. We're st the narrative in this country is still, or the question we talk about is whether racism exists as a problem. If, you're not, if you can't acknowledge racism, I don't know how you're gonna start talking about empire and these more profound questions, you know? I feel like America is ahead of us in that way because there is a conversation over there ha about happening over there. It's slavery compensation and they're also having conversations about reparations, reparations it's interesting yeah. people don't want to talk about money but empire was about money um although we have paid compensation this is a thing i mean yeah, we've got oh we can't say sorry because yeah. we might have to pay compensation we paid compensation to the mau mau in kenya because we were torturing killing castrating them in the 1950s you know it wasn't that long ago there's a very interesting film by George Monbiot on Double Down News about the family history of, I think, Dominic Cummings' wife's grandfather and also Dido Harding's in terms of um, colonial administrators. People might want to look it up. I haven't yeah. been able to confirm it, but um, it's really interesting how you, know, you look at ancestral families, um, aristocrats. They've all, you know, what were they doing in the empire? And it's quite interesting. I want to end on a kind of positive question, I think, which is if we think back to the 2012 Olympics, which many of us remember very fondly as this great moment of Britain or the United Kingdom on the international stage, having a very positive sense of its own identity. Have we changed? Has something buried come kind of come back up? Or what's, how do you explain the difference between then and now? I think uh, that's when the culture war began. I mean, I'm, I'm with Jonathan Coe, if you've read Middle England, he more or less argues that the London Olympic ceremony was when Brexit began. Because if you remember when it, that ceremony was happening, there was a couple of Tory MPs who got in trouble for saying, this is not my Britain. I hate all this PC crap. Why are there so many brown people? And I thought at the time they were, they were a minority, but maybe they were not. Maybe actually there's a lot of people who felt like that. They don't, don't buy that image of Britain as being fundamentally, you know, multicultural and happy about it, you know. But that's the image of Britain I have. And I see, I see things to be proud of in Britain, the NHS mm -hmm. and so on, which are essentially multicultural mm -hmm. achievements, you know. Um, but there's a how whole counter narrative um, that doesn't believe that, that believes probably that the great thing about Britain is that it was imperial and the empire was run by white people. And so we have the culture war, which is essentially a proxy war about race. That's not a cheerful point at which to end, is it? No. Samira? Although I, wonder, <laughs> I guess one could end by saying, if you look at America, to some extent, you look at Britain, demographics will inevitably over time force that to change. Many, many people, and I think one of the great positive statistics, if you can call it that, about um, British demographics is a mixed um, marriages and relationships. There've been many, many more of them from far earlier in Britain than in some other countries. Yeah, and that, that is why I'm optimistic, actually, because mm -hmm. young people, hey, society is just becoming more progressive. And young people really care about these issues about colonialism. I know there's a massive backlash amongst older, older people, you know, and, I'm, you know, you can't help but hear it. But I'm afraid to say they're not the future. And young people are going to change the world. And so...
we can have this awful time that we're living through but i ultimately i, I agree with you i think things are going to change for the better um, so, um thank you so much for your honesty willingness to deal with these things um thank you to all of you watching taking part i know for some people on this chat the conversation has been uncomfortable it's not about trying to make it uncomfortable it's about trying to be honest about things in our past that have not been talked about and if that makes some of us feel uncomfortable then it's a sign that there's there's more talking to be done there's more reading to be done i cannot recommend satnam's book highly enough i've really enjoyed reading it i think about it a lot um, and there's a documentary to come tell us that before you go yeah so story. my life is going to be ruined it's a uh, channel four two-part documentary coming out in autumn called empire land as well presumably i don't know what it's going to be called but yeah it's me meeting some of these characters we've talked about excellent <laughs> Well, look forward to seeing it. Look forward to seeing the paperback edition as well. Uh, thank you to all of you who's, um, who've taken part. And I know that there's lots more to come. So you'll need to click on your email link, go back to your email, and you can go to session two, which starts in a few minutes. Do enjoy the rest of your day. And Satnam Sangera, thank you Thanks again everyone. so much. And thank you, Samira. Thank you.